start in a timely manner. Welcome, everyone, especially from, I want to uh, thank everyone for being, here, for being here on behalf of the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior. I'm Heather Orham. I'm the director of the PhD program. So while I'm not going to introduce Maria, I have it, I'm going to give that honor to Dr. Feely. Uh, since we need here, yeah. So Dr. Feely, you're going to have that honor. But I want us to introduce you first. Oh. Um, but before I uh, introduce Dr. Feely, thank you all. I want to thank Maria's family and friends for being here. I know um, Maria's grandmother flew in from Denver. It is really an honor. This is a big deal for us, of course. It's a very exciting a big day for us and for Maria. All right, so Maria, about five years ago or so, you started to become really committed to working in the area of kidney transplantation and promoting living donor kidney transplantation. And we in the Department of Community Health now, behavior did not have that expertise to mentor you. And however, you forged forward. And then about, I don't know, maybe two weeks, a month later, I had a call from Dr. Louise Taylor, who's on the Zoom, who is the chief for transplant surgery at Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and PCMC. And she said, we're looking for a PhD student who can work on the in the area of transplant medicine and we have this great new intervention that we're starting and I said my goodness what an amazing I don't know coincidence or miracle that um, you were able to connect with Lise and Lise has supported you wonderfully over the past five years or so and also to connect with Dr. Feely who is a um, professor in the Department of Communication here at the University of Buffalo who works in organ donation for and has always been and as she moved into Dr. Taylor's lab, you took on the chief um, advisor role for him. So, on behalf of the department, thank you for a uh, big contribution. So, now I would love to see you in the moment. Maria, I think it's okay. Thank you. Um, is, is Lisa? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Tom Feely. I'm a professor of communication. Oh, here. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a professor of communication. Um, thanks, Heather. Where's Heather? Thanks, Heather, and thanks, Sarah Mona, for the committee members. And uh, the coincidence is is wonderful in that I met Lee shortly before three of us started working together, and it's been a really productive uh, collaboration that I hope continues. Um, so. Um, I'm always keen on a uh, dissertation defense to bring up what brings a candidate here, and it's a lot. So a lot is made of this in these studies, but uh, a master's degree um, with honors, a bachelor's degree, all high grades, uh, comp exams. So a lot happened before um, Maria could get to this point. So we should all remember that. Um, I was looking through old emails, Maria. You emailed me February 12th, 2018, to talk about um, potential relationship. And I want to thank Mark Hay for leaving. I probably wouldn't be your advisor. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, just kidding. So um, let me just stay finished before I invite uh, my colleague Lisa to say a few words. That half my life, I just realized I've been a professor. And it's just such a privilege. But the best part about being a, a professor is right now. Um, seeing the fruits of your labor. Unfortunately, people leave you and these relationships hopefully continue in some part, but this is the best part of being a research professor is, is students. And um, we're reminded that's why we're here. So thanks again. And th thank you for having me. Um, so do we have to, a way to pipe in, please? Yeah. Hi, uh, hi. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I I was looking through my old notes too. <laughs> and um yeah, she joined our research group in 2019. And actually I think originally it was just to be a research coordinator because she, um she uh needed to have a job and um she already had a research mentor, but then that um ended 
because the mentor moved. And I was excited that she wanted to actually also do her research and transplantation and be mentored um, by me and you and everybody else, but mostly also including me. So this is my first time mentoring a, a PhD student and sitting on a dissertation committee. Um, and, you know, at the time we hadn't completely developed our digital intervention. And so Maria helped a lot with that. She, um, besides being good at all of the PhD type stuff, she's actually really good with technology um, using Alchemer and she's very good at um, doing statistical comparisons. So she ended up contributing to a lot of our papers and in fact wrote 13 papers with us, um, three of which she's first author. Um, and, and that's because we, <laughs> we always needed her to contribute in one way or another to the other research that was being done in addition to the three papers that are informing her um, dissertation. And uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the interactions with her. She was always meticulous and thoughtful and took the time to make sure that she was clear on the concepts that she was writing about. Um, and I definitely look forward to her staying on with us and helping us through the next phase of our research. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you all for those really kind introductions and thank you all for being here today. I'm looking forward to working with you, Dr. Gaylor and Dr. Healy, more at UCMC, being part of that project. Um, so today I'll be talking about my dissertation work, which centers around the development of a digital education intervention to increase end-stage kidney disease patients' access to kidney transplantation. I'll start by giving a little background on end-stage kidney disease in the United States and patients' access to treatment options, specifically kidney transplantation. I'll also discuss intervention strategies that have been most effective to increase patients' access to kidney transplantation. In particular, I'll discuss digital education. And because the overarching aim of this dissertation is to inform the development of a digital educational intervention, I'll provide a roadmap of three intervention development stages, three dissertation studies that align with and inform each stage, and three subsequent manuscripts. I will then finish today um, talking about general conclusions and directions for future work. So to begin, end-stage kidney disease, or ESPD, affects over 750,000 Americans and is expected to reach as many as 1.2 million Americans by 2020, which is unprecedented. Um, the majority of patients are treated with chronic kidney disease, chronic dialysis therapy to stay alive. Um, however, dialysis only performs 10% um, of normal kidney function, which results in numerous debilitating symptoms such as exhaustion, nausea, and body aches and cramps. Um, it also results in a short, shortened life expectancy, which is only about five years on average. Um, there's also a high demand for um, scarce healthcare resources. So despite the SPD representing less than 1% of the Medicare population, care delivery for ESPD consumes over 7% of the Medicare fee claims, totaling over $35 billion in 2019. Kidney transplantation is the optimal treatment for ESKD compared to dialysis, um, resulting in greater longevity and also greater quality of life. However, only a fraction of people with ESKD receive a kidney transplant each year. Only 20% of the dialysis population are on the list to receive a deceased donor kidney, and only 6% receive a transplant each year.
when it comes to getting a transplant, patients have difficulty navigating the transplant system, particularly in finding living donor. Living donor kidney transplantation or LDKT is the best solution since the supply of deceased donor kidneys is constrained by aging and mortality patterns. So basically, if more people donate it, it can solve the organ shortage problem. Um, finding a living donor requires a considerable degree of self-efficacy by patients. Asking someone to donate to you can be awkward, emotional, overwhelming, and even patients who receive education or conversation skills training, they still may not choose to approach a donor. Um, to overcome this problem, the 2015 Consensus Conference on Increasing Access to LDKT advised on the use of digital interventions, which may support patients' learning and information outreach. However, the, um, sorry. Um, so finding a living donor requires a considerable degree of self -efficacy. And the most successful interventions to overcome this is to educate patients and their potential donors together via human facilitator. And this is often in the patient's home. Um, but this is time, resource, and staff intensive and difficult to use. Therefore, the digital education is promising because it makes the information more accessible and it makes um, sharing information easier. So that being said, this dissertation is situated within the development process of a digital educational intervention. In 2018, I joined the research team at CMC and we led by Dr. Lisa to develop a sharing oriented digital education to enhance learning and outreach about kidney donation. We chose animated videos for our educational medium because they, are promising due to their brevity and simplicity in conveying information. And this dissertation will further assess the evidence base for using this type of education. So this is an intervention development project. It had three stages, and I conducted a dissertation study to align with each of these stages. And this resulted in three corresponding manuscripts. The first stage was designing the intervention, and the first study was a scoping review of animated videos effects on individual health knowledge. The next stage was about refining the intervention content, and this was an assessment of patient receptivity to the animated video digital education, the intervention that we created. And the final stage was divining, devising an online implementation method and the corresponding study was to design a prototype of a web application to host the intervention videos. This dissertation had three overarching aims. The first was to evaluate if digital education might influence BSPD patients' knowledge about living donor kidney transplantation. The second was to evaluate which intervention strategy, strategies influence ESPD patients' likeliness to share the educational information. And the final aim was to examine whether the educational intervention could influence information sharing by ESPD patients to their social network members and for them to initiate conversations about the information. So now I'll walk you through each of my manuscripts, beginning with the first that informed the development stage of designing the intervention. My first manuscript, which was published in Austin Medical Sciences, sought to assess the effect of animated video on individual knowledge in order to inform its application to kidney transplant education and interest among patients in their social networks. The study objective for the first manuscript was to conduct a scoping review of published studies evaluating standalone animated video in adult health education to identify three things. 
the intervention design and delivery features, the impacts of animated video on individual knowledge and other outcomes, and finally, whether randomized controlled trials using animated video as a teaching strategy demonstrate greater effectiveness than interventions without animated video. So for the literature search, I used the PRISMA method of review, and the search was conducted throughout December of 2020. With regard to the keywords of the search, to ensure that I included all standalone animated video interventions that have thus far been created, I used different combinations of broad keywords and then discussed these with two experts on epidemiological and transplant studies to finalize that list of keywords. For inclusions, I included all original peer reviewed publications written in English that met the following criteria at least 18 years of age, examined a change of knowledge, and that the videos were standalone and maybe videos. So it's the sole intervention strategy. And finally, to assess outcomes based on pure animation with audio, articles were excluded if the standalone animation videos lacked audio or used multi-component teaching strategies. So the literature search resulted in 2,066 articles. Of these, 54 met the initial inclusion criteria. After exclusions, 10 articles remained. Um, I identified five more through reference harvesting. Um, resulting in a total of 15 articles that were included in the review. With regard to the study characteristics, the studies were predominantly in the US. They represented a range of healthcare topics, including kidney transplantation. And for the study type, there were eight randomized controlled trials, three between subjects designed, and four previous studies. For the study results pertaining to video design and delivery, the manuscripts were generally clinic-based. Most interventions included two-dimensional animation. They were relatively short in duration. Um, they spanned two to 16 minutes, but half were three minutes or less. And the majority of publications did not report the use of a learning theory, theory or a patient input to inform the video development. However, iterative des design and the modeling of the desired behaviors were included in some of the studies. For the study results pertaining to individual knowledge and other outcomes, there were significant participant knowledge gains reported in 80% of studies, including among at-risk groups. And there were also improvements in anxiety, concerns, and attitudes. And for the study results pertaining to the effectiveness compared to other education strategies, in the RCTs and also the quasi experimental studies, animation was superior to visual care frames and also live action video for increasing knowledge. And these knowledge gains were maintained across learners of varying literacy levels. So with regard to study limitations for manuscript one, there are only eight RCTs um, and the reporting of the animated video development methods were varied in their completeness. All of these things could bias the results. Um, the selection was limited to English language studies. And our group actually published two of the studies. Um, they were preliminary video tests and these were also included. For the study implications, there were aspects of animated video that promoted learning about kidney transplantation. This positive learning effect was attributed to the audiovisual audio format. This is education materials um, that combine audio with visual stimuli. Um, and audiovisual formats allow for dual channels of information processing. 
but you can process the audio information and the visual information separately and concurrently. Therefore, the information can be processed by learners more easily and enhance their comprehension, retention, and transfer of that information. And in addition to that, a greater amount of information can be processed in a shorter amount of time, so the learning can be more efficient. Um, so the next implication was that there was an anxiety-inducing effect with information, particularly the anxiety around learning difficult topics and anxiety in relation to the medical procedure itself. Um, so the ease of learning with animated video may help resolve this type of anxiety and enable a greater ability to learn these topics. And animation, especially when it's in the form of cartoons, has qualities that are appealing or amusing, which can also reduce anxiety. And because animation allows for a high degree of message crafting, you can focus on creating positive messages. Um, and for ESPD patients in particular, animated video may be promising to reduce their anxiety related to learning about um, undergoing procedures that are beneficial to their health, like kidney transplantation. So moving on to the next stage of the design process, the results of the first study informed the creation of a digital educational intervention. This is time. Um, so this is an educational animated video collection targeted to transplant candidates and their social networks. It aims to increase kidney transplant access with an emphasis on LDKT. It's delivered online to transplant candidates prior to and during the evaluation process. There were specific design goals for the kidney time videos. We wanted them to be understandable and short, approximately two minutes, easily streamable online, and optimized for viewing on computers and mobile devices and also intended for easy sharing with social network members. There's also a specific design process for kidney time. We use the multi-step design process. We involve patients, caregivers, and clinical stakeholders throughout the entire design process. And we aim for it to be optimally patient-centered, disseminable, attractive to patients, and acceptable to a diverse audience. So given the creation of the kidney time prototype, I will now discuss my second manuscript, which informed the development stage of refining the kidney time intervention content. My second manuscript, which was published in PLUS One, sought to assess learners' receptivity to the kidney time videos for future utility and implementation of the intervention. And it also sought to ensure the accessibility of the videos across transplant candidates of different races. So manuscript two had two aims. The first was to assess factors that influence learner receptivity to kidney time. And the second was to evaluate potential variation in response to kidney time in Black compared to non-Black viewers to inform potential culturally relevant adaptations. This, the study design of manuscript two, the data derived from the original kidney time development interview transcripts. And we examined these along three considerations. The patient's cognitive and communication barriers to accessing LDKT. The degree that these barriers may be addressed by kidney time. So in other words, the facilitators and a comparison of the responses between black and non-black participants. The participants for this study were patients and donors associated with UCMC. At least 18 years of age in English speaking, um, care partners were also invited by participants. And we enrolled 50% um, of patients who identified as Black or African American. And this generally reflects our patient population. For data analysis for manuscript two, this is a secondary analysis of the original transcripts. 
I reviewed the transcripts to conceptualize the data in abstracted passages using in vivo pertaining to the cognitive and communication barriers. And second, the perceived value of using human type videos to learn and share with social network members. Um, the transcriptions were analyzed using template analysis, which is a form of content analysis. And the thematic responses were also stratified by racial groups and percentages. For participant characteristics of the transplant candidates and recipients, um, in the study, Black and non Black transplant candidates and recipients were a similar age of 55 years and 57 years, respectively. Half of the participants were male. However, Black participants were twice as likely than non Black participants to have less than a college education. Half were likely to be married or living with someone. And almost three quarters of Black participants had an income that was less than 30,000 compared to 3% of the non Black participants. Um, and finally, the majority of participants in each race group were transplant recipients versus transplant candidates. For participant characteristics of donors and care partners in the study, donors and care partners were similar demographically to the transplant candidates and recipients. However, there were considerably more non-Black donors and care partners than Black donors and care partners, um, six black donors and care partners as um, compared to 41. Um, and in addition, almost all the non-black participants were prior or potential donors, while almost all the black participants were care partners. In the study, a number of content codes emerged for cognitive and communication barriers to LGBT as well as cognitive and communication facility, facilitators of the kidney time videos to increase access to LDKT. And I will discuss each of these together. So first, the content codes for cognitive barriers to accessing LDKT were ambivalence, lack of knowledge, and concern for the donor. For ambivalence, patients reported feeling a lack of urgency for a transplant. Um, for patients who were not yet requiring dialysis, they believed that they had time to find a donor. Um, those who were already on dialysis thought that the dialysis would keep them alive until a deceased donor kidney became available. And um, the ambivalence also stemmed from patients feeling undeserving of the donation. Some patients felt guilt over poor self care that contributed to their kidney failure, and others were just resigned to. To the, to the disease. Um, the second code care category was lack of knowledge. This was mainly due to patients reported unawareness of the advantages of LDKT and misunderstandings about their eligibility to receive LDKT. And last, um, the code category was concern, concern for the donor. Participants reported um, concern for the donor's health and well being. The most frequent of these concerns reported was that the donor might develop kidney disease in the future, and that they would experience guilt for bringing that upon them. Um, patients did not want to sub subject others to the extensive testing process to determine their eligibility. Um, they thought that it was. Too, too rigorous and that it would be an obstacle to their voluntary. Um, and there are also some concerns that were more proximal to the surgery, like um, pain or surgical complications. So the content codes for communication barriers to accessing LDKT were reluctance to talk about LDKT and difficulty talking about LDKT. For reluctance, participants reported difficulty asking for help in general, but especially for something as big as a kidney. They often anticipated rejection and anticipated ineligibility of themselves to receive um, a living donor kidney or for a donor to be able to donate to them. For difficulty talking about LDKT, 
participants reported just not having the right words to ask. Um, they wanted to avoid making others uncomfortable and they were afraid that they would have difficulty coping with the rejection. The content codes for kidney time videos as a cognitive facilitator of learning about LGBT were attention gain, efficient learning, manageable content, emotional impact, and new knowledge. For attention getting, participants reported that the videos were attractive, which held their attention. For efficient learning, um, the participants reported that the video information was simple and it got right to the point, which helped their learning. For manageable content, participants reported that the videos had short information and chunk information that they thought made learning more manageable. Um, for the emotional impact, participants reported that the characters were relatable to them and scenes were relatable to them, like they could plug into the experience. And for new knowledge, participants reported that the knowledge addressed their preconceived notions and myths and addressed their concerns. And last, the content codes for the kidney time videos as a cognitive, as a communication facilitator of learning about LGBT for the delivery of the videos through many dissemination channels and the videos being broadly shareable. So for the delivery through many channels, participants reported that um, this could increase their communication with others about LGBT. Um, they often indicated that they would show the videos in person, specifically to close family members. Um, and the participants also anticipated that they would be able to show the videos electronically to have a wider reach to people. For broadly shareable, participants imagined the videos um, could be given to a wide range of social network members, which included children, caregivers, grandparents and they were appropriate for each of those groups. So here are the thematic responses stratified by racial group and by role using percentages. And a meaningful difference for the group analysis um, we consider to be a 10% difference. So beginning with the cognitive barriers, um, Black versus non-Black participants were considerably more likely to report concern for a donor health. So that's 41% um, versus 3% respectively. For communication barriers, Black versus non-Black participants were more likely to report reluctance to talk about LGBT. Um, it's 24% versus 12% respectively. And also difficulty talking about LGBT. Um, in class for the kidney time videos as cognitive facilitators, fewer Black versus non Black participants reported efficient learning and um, also manageable content after watching the videos. Um, but it should be noted that the codes for the other categories, attention getting, emotional impact, and new knowledge, um, were similarly reported by participants in both base groups. And this may potentially be attributed to the coding strategy that we use. We included in our coding both positive and negative statements. And this would encompass, for example, design recommendations that patients made, and also statements about the video appeal, and these could bias the results and bias the findings. So last, for the manuscript to limitations and implications, there were a number of limitations. Um, first, the generalizability of these findings limited. Um, because the participants were predominantly Black and non-Hispanic white adults who have at least a high school education and live in Buffalo and her, were referred to a transplant center, it may only be generalized to those patients. Um, differences were also found between race groups. 
And there could, could also be a function of varying demographic factors that were different between Black and non Black individuals, such as employment or income status rather than race. And finally, the sample was predominantly transplant recipients rather than those seeking a kidney transplant, which could have biased the way we identify the patient's concerns. And for the implications, Although Black participants more often expressed concern for donor health, concerns reduction appeared to align with new knowledge, which is promising after viewing the videos. Um, in the animated videos, easier learning and non-threatening nature could help introduce more sensitive topics. And finally, despite the communication barriers, participants in both race groups reported that the videos could facilitate communication and increase their social support. So finally, I'll discuss my third and final manuscript, which informed the final development stage, which is devising in an online implementation method. For my final manuscript, which was published in Progress and Transplantation, um, I sought to design a prototype web application to host the kidney time videos that is easy to use and share. So to write an introduction to my final manuscript, I'll briefly discuss some previous web-based transplant education programs. So previous web-based kidney transplant education programs are promising. Patients are willing to use them. Many have been successful in increasing patient knowledge about LGBT. However, only around a third of participants return to the websites after the initial exposure to them. And this variable engagement may be due to issues of the usability of the websites. Um, and usability, usability problems commonly occur in chronic disease populations. These tend to be um, older adults, and this is attributed especially to disability. And this is important for ESP patients in particular, as they tend to be over 65 years. Almost half suffer from vision, cognition, or motor function impairment. And these limitations can pose serious problems to their using what they education. So the study design of creating the web application had four design phases. There was the initial prototype design, um, an expert usability assessment, then end user testing and revision of the prototype that happened in rounds. We collaborated with a software engineer to create the initial prototype using the Alchemer platform. This is a research survey platform, but it's also editable to create other research products. And as we were also including surveys within the web application, it made sense to do this. So this study was informed by usability guidelines for older adults. This generally includes things like appropriate um, text size, high contrast, same serif type fonts, um, all the, these things that make it easier to read and use online resources. The preliminary features of the web app prototype um, were, was beginning with an electronic consent. Then there was a series of survey questions then the sequential kidney time videos, they couldn't be stopped or replayed, which could potentially be used for tailoring of the intervention content. And then finally, there was a homepage that allowed for previewing of all the videos and also sharing. So for the second design phase, the expert usability assessment, we the initial prototype was revised based on recommendations from five experts that we identified, a human factors and ergonomics expert for older adults, the PI who was involved in patient care and rep represented patient needs, social psychologist with web-based usability experience, medical writer, and a health services researcher, which represented our development team. 
Each of the experts independently rated the severity of the issues and provided um, provided advice on how to move forward. And all the pro all of the problems were addressed without major overhaul of the system. So for the end user testing and design division, for the study, we approached English speaking adults in the clinic who were undergoing um, evaluation for a kidney transplant um, at UCMC. The end user testing involved think aloud interviews while the patients use the web application. And a think aloud interview is basically when a participant speaks their mind and their intentions and actions as they're using the application out loud. Um, so the sessions were conducted at the transplant clinic um, with the moderator and also an observer, and this was the same for all rounds. There were multiple rounds of testing conducted to um, for the platform redesigned between each of the rounds based on the patient feedback. And um, each round was concluded when no new usability problems emerged. We also followed up with semi-structured interviews on the likes and dislikes of the platform uh, and aspects that they found easy or difficult, as well as some suggestions. So the Characteristics of the end user testing sessions. Um, they were conducted in four rounds. Um, unique participants in each round, um, respectively. The sessions ranged from 30 to 80 minutes. About half of participants chose to use the clinic computer, and the other half used the research iPad. Importantly, um, about half of participants reported poor vision or poor motor control, or rather we also observed these in clinic as they performed the actions on the web application. And the program was completed without any assistance by 70% of participants. The demographics of the participants in the end user tests on the mean age was 50 years, half were male, over half had a high school or trade school education and around half had an income of less than $30,000 a year. Um, it should also be said that we recruited participants, 50% um, who identified as Black or African American. Um, with regard to health literacy, patients had moderate to high levels of health literacy, and the vast majority had access to an internet capable cell phone or computer. The main usability issues identified in this study were three overarching categories, readability, navigation, and finding and sharing the videos. And at the end of the study, substantial improvements were found in the usability of most functions after implementing certain features that we identified during the rounds of user testing. So the first set of usability problems related to readability. This was um, the text that was too small, unclear text, or just being text laden. Um, and these issues were resolved by implementing simple features like increasing the text size, changing the typeface like sans serif, which is developed specifically for online use, and um, just simplifying and reducing the text on the screen. Next, usability problems related to navigation included button clickability, error recognition, scrolling challenges, and long page text challenges. These were resolved by implementing features such as increasing the button size, highlighting the errors, reducing the content per page, and using cues for participants to know when to scroll, like cutting off some of the text on the bottom of the screen. Finally, usability problems related to finding and sharing videos. 
included video discoverability, video topic search, and video sharing. For this, it required some more extensive revision. Um, in the original homepage, for example, all of the videos were listed and it required patients to then search and find the video. We revised this by putting the videos into three categories that would allow patients to identify which category of videos they were looking for and to then find the specific video more easily. So this is the final prototype homepage. This is the one that would appear on the iPad, so the tablet version. Um, and as you can see, there were the three overarching categories. As well on the bottom, we initially had one large share button, but participants couldn't identify how they wanted to share. And this was a case where the navigation had to be expanded for them to see all the options to identify the options. So for the semi-structured interview results, patients reported that the web application was easy to navigate. They liked the modular content because they could just zoom in on what they were looking for. They said learning was efficient using it. It was pretty user-friendly, but they found the research surveys tedious, which is expected. For limitations, um, as with the previous study, um, there's limited generalizability. Um, for the study, we use direct observation rather than a webcam or a screen sharing, but this is mainly due to the simplicity of the design. It didn't require the web buttons. We used a rapid cycle iterative approach compared to a more classical single design approach. Um, and this allowed us to explore and realize and test concepts a lot more rapidly than we could have been able to do otherwise. This web application was not tested on smartphones. This is something for future research, given the high percentage of patients that had new smartphones. And this was also not tested for independent use, which is another study for the future. For implications, um, we found similar usability findings to other studies, but ours differed in that we provided much more detailed information, both on the candidates' experiences using an electronic interface, and we also delineated the design revisions on, in response to the usability problems in more detail. And these results may be generalized to other web educational technologies for ESP patients. I will conclude this presentation with a general discussion of the dissertation findings. So for the cross-pinning groups, animated videos about living donation have the potential to promote ESPD patients' efficient learning and to address their attitudes about the transmission procedure. This is especially important given that ESPD patients commonly report being overwhelmed by the type of education they receive. Often they find it overwhelming, especially the text-based type of education. Um, it's just difficult for them to take it. And they have trouble retaining them. And animated video is promising because it can make that education more manageable for them. Um, next, web based implementation of animated video education has the potential to support the SPD patients' information outreach to their social networks by making information accessible and making sharing of the information more easy. And finally, um, this study showed the importance of using an audience-centric iterative development process in order to capitalize on the learning benefits of using a digital education strategy. Uh, in particular, while animated video has a powerful messaging potential due to the ability to revise so readily, 
multi-stakeholder and patient-inclusive iterative approach is necessary to use animation in a way that promotes information processing, but also limits the cognitive load. And in addition, learner verification of the educational materials is necessary throughout the entire pre-production phase um, to ensure that unsuitable design can be revised prior to the final prototype. For study limitations, the generalizability is limited. Participants for um, both manuscripts C and D were recruit, recruited from a single transplant center in Buffalo and were predominantly Black and non Hispanic. Um, the videos didn't formally test race and other social determinants in relation to the efficacy of the animated videos or the feasibility of the web based educational technologies, which is something to test in the future. The, um, this dissertation does not assess the effectiveness of implementing the full kidney time intervention, both the videos and the web application in a remote setting, so outside the clinic. Um, and it does not assess the effectiveness of kidney time to influence ESPD patients' waitlisting placement or receipt of LDKT. So for future directions, we need to assess the effectiveness of any time, the entire intervention to affect ESPD patients who receive of LDPT. We also need to assess the barriers and facilitators of any time on remote from the clinical setting. And there's a RCT currently in progress to assess these things. So to conclude, I would just like to thank my co-authors, um, Drs. Renee Cadso, Laura Cavuto, Beth Dahl, Todd Lucas, Molly Ranahan, Lorraine Tumil Burhalter, and Marina Zakaria. And I'd also like to give special thanks to my committee, Drs. Tom Healy, Lise Taylor, Heather Oram, and Sarah Mullen for today. And with that, are there any questions? Yeah, <laughs> I got like two of those. I just, um, it's more of a comment as much as a question. I've learned your thoughts about um, sort of uh, application of all this. I mean, we have quite a bit of federal funding to do some of this. I wonder if uh, lesser funded transplant centers would advance these, use these videos or there's some way to make it. So maybe the centralized videos. Do you have thoughts about how this might be used in other centers? Um, well, firstly, there's a lot of use of these videos for testing many both web applications that are more enclosed and websites that are more publicly available. The website would be a lot cheaper to create to even the video is more expensive. They require an actual animated to do multiple rounds of revision. On um, this, we're considering partnerships with other centers. The question is whether the videos are generalizable to other patients in other centers, but that's what we're currently testing. My question too. Family members. I've seen some of the video that you were looking at, and I was really impressed. And I probably fall into the category of all of people not understanding. And while she was working on it, I was really impressed how much information I retained. So I thought it was very good video. Um, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, I have a question. 
it's a question I uh, think about myself. So I'd be happy if you could answer it for me. And that is, uh, do you think that it there is a need to um, adapt the videos to be more culturally relevant to our um, Black and African American population? So based on the findings of the qualitative study in my second manuscript, there are some things that could potentially be addressed, like African American patients' concerns, maybe more positive framing, revising the script, the imagery could be necessary. But I think the iterative process and continuing evaluation of the videos could help first level. Thank you. Presentations, I, I learned a lot. Um, you mentioned kind of social determinants that you might want to consider. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that because, at least in what you presented, race seems to be the only kind of demographic characteristic that was considered. Although you did mention, um, you know, income or, or level of education, those kind of things. And I'm just wondering, comment on that and maybe even prioritize what might be more or less important among the social determinants. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely in the second manuscripts, the focus was on cultural adaptations, but obviously from the demographic features, there were large differences in the income, in education, in caregiver support, all of these things could very likely contribute or even be like closely related to the differences in race. And yeah, those things are future study should prioritize those to parse the pieces of art. Yeah, so this was a question about whether or not there were patient responses to the videos that were unexpected. I think the thing that surprised me the most was how patients and anyone can identify with the characters in the videos and how such minute changes in facial expression or movements, color can have such a profound impact on understanding. All of these things that you sort of take for granted if you see a cartoon impact understanding greatly. So you shared with us an impressive body of work. You made it look seamless, easy, but I'm guessing that was not the case. That you encountered some significant challenges in developing this work along the way. And I just wanted to invite you to share some of the challenges you encountered and how you problem solved your way through them. Yeah, so this research. I did not conceptualize beforehand. Everything was deeply connected to the development of this intervention. So it was really time dependent. We didn't sometimes know that we needed a study, except for really the scoping review until the need came about. So everything was really organic. But then given that organic structure, being methodical in designing a study to fit the need was something that took careful thought and took a lot of guidance from my, my mentors to make sure it was correct.
our we're at time. So um, I want to thank you again for your excellent presentation. And thank you to the audience uh, for having been here to support Maria. Now we move on to a second phase of the dissertation proposal. Uh, defense at this point is a closed meeting just with your committee members.